just seen, and I yes. appreciate you both very much. I'm so grateful to God for for you being a part of this church. And to all of you out there on Facebook, we greet you this morning and glad you're with us. Hope you're enjoying the service and the presence of the Lord wherever you are. And we're all together in the spirit. So thanks again for being a part of the service today and sharing the time you have with us and the Lord. God bless y'all. Praise the Lord. Amen. God is good. Yes. Amen. And he's always in good mood. At the end of the day, a cliche walks into a bar, fresh as a daisy, cute as a button, sharp as a bat. Okay, didn't like that. How about a dyslexic walks into a bra? Jesus, the light that's going to come into the world on the fourth day, or 4,000 years into this situation that we're living in, time. But he said, moreover, the light of the moon shall be as the light of the sun, and the light of the sun shall be sevenfold. He tells us that we are to be a reflection of Jesus. So here it's, it's speaking to this reality, that Jesus is the light of the sun, and the light of the sun will be sevenfold stronger when we get to the end times, when we get to the very last days. Amen. As the light of seven days, in the day that the Lord bindeth up the breach of his people and healeth the stroke of their wound. So the light of the sun will be sevenfold, and moreover the light of the moon shall be as the light of the sun. It will be just like, it will look just like the sun. Well, we are the reflection, which is what the moon is, so we are that reality. We are the, the reflection of Jesus in the last days. This is prophetic speaking from the word of God, and our light will shine. Remember, Suzanne was talking a couple weeks ago as well about hiding a light under the bushel, and we're the salt of the earth, and so on and so forth. Yeah. So this is, this is what he's talking about. Now, here's the deal. We think of everything as being natural because we're natural, right? Because we're human. Now, we understand that there's spirit reality and that we are spirit beings and so forth, but still, it's so hard to disconnect from this. But what the Bible actually teaches us, even based on this scripture alone, we're more like holograms than we are exactly. real. We're just a reflection. We're just, we're, we're not, we, we are so used to dealing with this flesh all the time, cleaning it and taking care of it and right. abusing it and dressing it and 
you know, all the things that we have to do. So we're constantly being uh, affected by that. But the spirit man, the real part of us, the yes. eternal part of us, often gets lost in the may, you know, yes. in, the, in, in all the mess. When in fact, if we would look at ourselves as just this hologram, basically, it's just yes. only there because of Jesus. And when that time is fulfilled, we're out of here. Exactly. And our real reality, our true being, is going to be forever. It's, going to, it, it's, yes. it's eternal. It has been from the moment that we got born again. And so I, I just, I want us to understand, I, I want us to focus more and more in, in the times that we live. And I'm not saying this is the last day, but I'm saying it sure could be because of the way everything looks and the way everything is unwinding. I'm not trying to freak people out. I'm not nervous about it or afraid. Right. It either is or it isn't. Either way, God's still got charge. He's in control. But so we live our lives as though he's coming tomorrow. Yes. But we don't just sit down on a couch somewhere and just say, well, okay, well, there's no point in going to work or there's no point in doing this or taking care of the family or anything because Jesus is coming. Well, he might just trick you, amen, and come a little later. So I'm just saying, whenever he comes, that's his business, right? We're going to be ready to go and we'll be out of here with him. So that's what I really want to talk about some of this real, real prophecy. Because we're the closer, believe me, the closer we get to the end times, the more prophetic words are going to come forth, and they're not all coming from Jesus. No. We know that the, even the, if it weren't for his return, even the righteous would be confused and hung up and all this stuff and start to follow false teaching and all the rest of that. So we need to say, I'm not, again, I'm not saying don't believe in prophecy. I'm saying believe in the word of God first and foremost, and the rest, the rest of the stuff will take care of itself eventually anyhow, praise the Lord. So let's just go, let's begin. I'm going to read several scriptures here to start with. Uh, simply because I'm random and don't know where to go. But we'll start with 1 Peter 1, verses 2 through 7. 1 Peter 1, 2 through 7. Elect, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, so now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Anybody can relate to that in the days that we're living right now, right? That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold, that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. So we're going to go through crap. We know we are. We know we're in a world and it's full, filled with junk, right? And in this world, you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer. He's overcome the world, praise God. So 2 Peter now, chapter 1, verse 19. We, ought, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Which is, takes me back to Isaiah 30, verse 26. But nevertheless, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 14 through 18. 2 Corinthians 4, 14 through 18. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise us up also by Jesus shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And we'll finish with this, Ephesians chapter 3, 18 through 21. Ephesians 3, 18 through 21. So may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, length, depth, and height, 
and to know the love of Christ with path of knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. So our physical world is subordinate to a larger, transcendent spiritual world, which is the superior reality. Praise the Lord. And the Bible also reveals a universe of more than three dimensions. Mm -hmm. It talks about a... Actually, they talk about ten dimensions, but I'm not going to get into all of that, but the Bible is saying there's more than three dimensions, and it reveals a creator that is transcendent or beyond the material universe. Yes. So none of those things bind him, or, 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 or is he bound by them, or is any spirit. That's all a miracle really is, is a cessation of time yes. or a speeding up of time, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, time is, we live in at least four dimensions, okay? Not just length, width, and height, but there's also the physical dimension of time itself. They've determined that time is actually a physical reality. Yes. And the truth is, if, if we're not in time, we're in the spirit, right? Exactly. right? So, I mean, uh, it's, it's a physical dimension. Time is now known to be a physical property. That's right. According to science, according to physics, Einstein talked about some of these things. Uh, he taught that uh, time varies with mass, with acceleration, and with gravity. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Remember the story? He's on a bus, an open-air bus, and he's riding along, and he's looking at a clock. Yeah. And he's thinking, if I could go fast enough, I could get there before that clock could ever tick another minute. Right. And if I could even go faster, I'd get there before it got to where it is now. Exactly. So he's, he's, he's trying to rent, you know, figure all these things out. But here's the deal. Is God subject to gravity? Nope. Is he subject to constraints of mass or acceleration? Nope. No and no. no. Right? God is not someone who has lots of time. God is outside of time altogether. Right. There's no such thing as time for him. No. Exactly. Amen? Look, let's look at Isaiah 57 and verse 15. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. So, in God's eyes, we are already in eternity. Our spirit being exactly. that born again part of us, is, which is his child. He already sees us this way. He knows the end from the beginning, right? So it's already a done deal as far as he's concerned. He inhabits eternity, and since God has the ability to create us, then he for sure has the ability to get a message to us. Sure. Praise the Lord. But how does he authenticate his message? And that's the question that we all struggle with when somebody gets up and wants to prophesy, right? And I, you know, we, most of us have been in church long enough, and in the Pentecostal circles at least, and others as well, I'm sure, but I know... Uh, and I'm not speaking for all churches, just some experiences I've had where people would get up and prophesy and all they would do is condemn everybody in the church. <laughs> Seriously. And the scripture clearly teaches that all prophecy is to edify, to build up, and yes. to encourage. And yet people are claiming that they're speaking for God and all the time they're condemning the people that God loves. Yeah. So that's, that's part of it. But he's, how, does, how, how can God authenticate his message? I mean, when I hear all this stuff and I'm looking and looking for answers and looking for the end result, uh -huh. it, it, it's, it's confusing, is it not? And again, I'm not questioning. Maybe it's just I'm done, dull, you know, and dense. Uh, I don't know. But how does he authenticate the message? How does he make sure we know the message is really from him? Right. How do we know it's not a fake? How do we know the guy's not a phony or the woman that's doing the prophesying just is dense themselves and doesn't know what they're doing? Look at Isaiah 46. And verse 10. Declaring the end from the beginning, mm -hmm. and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. So one way is to demonstrate that the source of his message is from outside our time domain. It's from <coughs> outside of time, right? Right? That is what true prophecy is, and that's what God is talking about 
when he prophesies or when a, a person would prophesy in the scripture, he's not, it's outside of time. Half the time, like, the, like I said last week, Daniel's prophesying and he's saying, what am I prophesying, Lord? What does this mean? Yeah. And God says, it's not for you. The prophecy is for you to speak, but the prophecy is not for you to experience. The prophecy will come <coughs> thousands of years later. Right. right? So let's look at fulfilled prophecy. Right? Instead of just trying to guess, let's just look at what is real that we know to be fact, right? The life of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. A central theme of the entire Bible is the actual presentation of the central figure of all history, Jesus, the Messiah. Everything in here is about this. Yes. Whether we understood that or not, every story, everything in this is about the coming Messiah right. and what he will do. Amen? Look at Psalms 40 and verse 7. Then said I, lo, I come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me. Now, in Hebrews 10, 7, it's repeated. It's just quoted from back there. All right? And then John 5, 39. This is, this is Hebrews 7. Uh, I come in the volume of the book, it's written of me, to do thy will, O God. And then John 5, 39. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. <coughs> And they are they which testify of me. Uh -huh. So every biblical record, every detail, every place, every name, every number are all by deliberate design. Yes. Now, I know that sounds fantastic, but we're talking about God here. We're not yes. talking about humans. The word came by the spirit of God right. and it came on to men and men just wrote it out. Right. Amen. And all of those things, every number, they're all deliberate, and they all are by design, and they all point to Jesus. Yes. He's on every page, intricately hidden in every detail yes. to be revealed mm -hmm. to those who have the Spirit of God. Yes. Jesus confounded the religious leaders of his day yes. because they couldn't grasp yes. this fact mm -hmm. that he was not only the the prophesier, yeah. but the fulfillment of the prophecy. Yes. They, they couldn't grasp the meaning, the true meaning of the Old Testament. All they could really grasp was the laws and the rules and the regulations. Yep. Anything beyond that was spirit, and they had, did not have the spirit, so they couldn't receive it. Right. So look at, let's look at this in Matthew 22, verse 41 through 46. And I mean, we should, have, there, we should have peace in the midst of chaos and trouble exactly. because of Jesus. Not because of what somebody says, but because of what Jesus has said and done. Exactly. Amen. So while the Pharisees, excuse me, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? And they say unto him, The son of David. He saith unto them, How then does David in the spirit call him Lord? saying, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then called him Lord, how is he his son? And no man was able to answer him a word, neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. They couldn't understand what he was talking about. They couldn't understand that he, Jesus Christ, was the embodiment of every prophecy of the Old Testament. It totally went over their heads. They just didn't grasp it at all. And today, we've got to make sure that we don't fall into the same trap yes. by failing to see Christ for who he was prophesied yes. to be. Yes. Praise the Lord. Jesus opened his ministry in Nazareth, the town that he grew up in. Now look at in Luke chapter 4, 16 through 21. So he goes to the synagogue that he'd gone to all of his life as a child growing up, right? And he, go, he walks into this synagogue and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, now he didn't ask for the book of Isaiah. That's the book they gave him. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So he, 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 and it was delivered to him there, the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. 
to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Hallelujah. Yes. And he closed the book and he gave it again to the minister and he sat down and the eyes of all of them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And, they be, and he began to say unto them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Amen. Now the complete passage is in Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. So let's go there just to have a clearer look at this. Isaiah, excuse me, Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn. So, Jesus stopped at what is a comma in the scripture, in the Bible. And he deliberately left out the additional phrase, and the day of vengeance of our God. Yeah. Now, he intentionally limited his reading to his first coming. Because yeah. mm -hmm. that's what he was there for, yes. right? This day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. Yeah. Right? So the day of vengeance has been deferred mm -hmm. right. for at least 2,000 years. Right. So the pause of that comma in Isaiah 61 has lasted almost 2,000 years. Yes. By quoting Old Testament prophecy that his listeners were familiar with, he was declaring to be the Messiah, the awaited one. Yes. The one that they've been waiting on. Yes. Amen? Look at Luke 24, verse 27. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. So here, what does he do? He's reinforcing God's sovereignty by speaking a plan that involved salvation of all of humanity. Yes. For all, for whosoever would. Yeah. Amen. And so some, some people, even today, deny that he claimed to be God. But anybody who's unaware of his claims hasn't really read the Bible. Right. He, he's declaring that he's God. Yes. Amen. His claim to be God is the very reason they crucified him. Yes. Right. Yeah. The issue is still, were his claims valid? Our individual destinies hinge on that issue. Not everybody that says, Lord, Lord. You know what I'm saying? Not everybody is truly a Christian. And I'm not making the decision who is or who isn't. That's up to God. I'm just saying not everybody believes the truth of who Jesus is. That's true. Yes. Now look at Matthew 5, 17 and 18. Think not that I've come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Amen. Praise the Lord. And I do mean praise the Lord because there's no way I can keep the law. Amen. I can't even keep Iowa law. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, I got problems. We're dealing with the Almighty, praise God. And he knows that. Yes. That's why he came and fulfilled it because no man could do it. God. Now, he was a man, yes. but he was full yes. with God. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. And he did everything he did by the Spirit of God. He said it himself. I only say what my father says. I only do what my father does. Yes. That's how he was successful exactly. in fulfilling the law, mm -hmm. the demands of the law. So a jot is one of 22 Hebrew letters. And you can mistake it easily for a, a comma or an apostrophe. Just a little thing, Right? A tittle is a tiny mark that distinguishes some letters, kind of like we have nouns and verbs and so on and so forth. They don't have all that. They just have more words, amen, or they add to them, like verily, verily. You know, he's being emphatic about something. So we would say it like this. We're not done until we cross every T and dot every I. That's basically what he's saying. There's, he's, in other words, what he's saying is it's literal interpretation that I'm looking for. But you don't understand it because you're looking at just the words on the page and you're not seeing in the spirit right. what I'm really trying to get across to you. 
And what I have been trying to get across to you for 4,000 years, up to this point, right? Or to that point, anyway. So we need a pre precise interpretation. A literal view, now, don't misunderstand me. A literal view doesn't deny the existence of figures of speech or metaphors or similes or analogies. You know, I mean, that is, that's not what we're talking about. It doesn't have to be word for word, you know. In fact, uh, God uses those things himself. Look, look at Hosea 12.10. I have also spoken by the prophets, and I have multiplied visions and used similitudes by the ministry of the prophets. So, you know, when I'm using allegories or metaphors and stuff, and you think, well, he's off on a tandem here, and he doesn't know what he's talking No, God does the same thing. That's, that's the way he speaks to us. He uses these other things to bring out greater truth or to make it more understandable to us, praise the Lord. And so for most of us, as Westerners, prophecy is... is it's like a, a prediction and then a fulfillment. That's the Greek model or, or way to think. That's, that's the way they thought. That's the way they responded to things. But to the Hebrew mind, prophecy is very often and most often a pattern. Yes. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 11. Now all these things happened unto them for examples or examples. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. So that, in samples, that Greek word is tupos. And it, it's where we get the word type. It's an anticipatory pattern or symbol. Right? And so look at Genesis chapter 22, verses 13 and 14. And I'll show you an example here. Genesis 22, 13 and 14. This is Abraham. God's told him to go sacrifice your son and so forth, right? So Abraham lifted up his eyes. He's got Isaac is on the altar. Isaac's bound. He's ready to, got the knife raised. And Abraham lifts up his eyes and he looked and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. What will be seen? God's deliverance. Yes. God said that child is going to be the father, you know, it's going to be the, the progenitor of all of humanity that are going to be saved. All the righteous, all the believers, right? And so Abraham, he's going to kill this kid. And the reason he's going to kill him is because he believes what God told him. God will raise him up if he has to. If that's what has to take place. He'll resurrect him. Yeah. Right? So Abraham's in the role of the father. Isaac is in the role of the son. Uh -huh. Abraham apparently realizes this is an anticipatory uh, enactment of a prophecy because he named the site. God will show up. God will be there. Jehovah Jireh. God will provide. Right. right? He tells his son, God will provide a ram, yes. a lamb for the sacrifice, right? So in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. What? The fulfillment of God's prophecy, of God's yes. word. Amen. So it was his confidence that Isaac would be resurrected that he went ahead and spoke of it in the New Testament. Look in Hebrews 11 and verses 18 and 19. Of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. So symbolically, he did raise him from the dead. He, he was ready to kill him, but he showed up with the sacrifice, the lamb that was caught in the thicket, right? So what Abraham may not have realized is that 2,000 years later, another father would offer his son as an offering for sin on that very spot. Praise the Lord. Now, just the same way that Israel was unable to discern from the Old Testament prophets that the Messiah would come, twice, first as a suffering servant and finally as a reigning king. See, they thought he was coming. They didn't have any clue about the second coming mm -hmm. in terms of the rapture because all they, all they wanted to do was, well, are you going to overthrow the Roman government? Right. Are, you gonna, right. are we going to have a revolt here, a rebellion? And Jesus said, no, you, look, you don't get it. You don't understand the kingdom, right? 
His kingdom will come, but not until after the rapture. So Jesus' return will be in two events. First, the church, right? Catching away. And then he comes again the second time to fulfill the covenant with Israel to establish his kingdom. Praise the Lord. The first is the rapture. The second is the kingdom establishing. Yes. Now, when the rapture takes place, I'm not to argue. I'm not going to argue about it. I don't know. Will we go through the, the tribulation? I don't really think so, but I think we'll go through at least part of it. The first three years, maybe. I don't know. But we're going to be spared the wrath, yes. the judgment that comes, right? We're going to have to deal with some stuff because we're in the world, right? But I don't believe we're here during the worst uh, parts of it. Because how could the enemy be loosed yeah. if the Spirit of God is still operating and still functioning here right. through his body? Amen. Right. But that's just another argument. John 14, <laughs> verses 1 through 3. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13 through 18. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. <clears throat> For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Praise the Lord. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So this great cloud, it's a cloud of witnesses that we read about that's looking at what's going on with us and saying, God, I wish I would have been born in that day, because that's the time we're all looking forward to and hoping to be a participant in. That's a great cloud that we get, those that have already gone to be with the Lord. Yes. Amen. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 through 53. 1 Corinthians 51, or excuse me, 15, verses 51 through 53. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Amen. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trump shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Hallelujah. Now, when he talks about, can you go back to verse 51 again? Sorry. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Now, it's interesting, because he said, those who are asleep, with it, we shouldn't mourn for those who are asleep, as some do. Now, remember when Lazarus was, he was told that Lazarus was dead. He said, no, he's sleeping. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the little girl that he raised from the dead. Why did he say, why did he say okay, he's dead, but I'm going to raise him from the dead? Because as far as Jesus was concerned, he was alive. He wasn't dead. He was still alive. The spirit man was alive. And he went there and just brought the body back to life. Same as he did with the little girl. So that's what he's saying to us. The people we think of as dead, they're not dead. They're asleep. Their bodies are just sleeping somewhere, even if they've disintegrated. Amen? Or been cremated. It doesn't matter. Yes. They are alive. Yes. And with the Lord. Yes. And when the time comes, the Lord will resurrect a body, a spiritual body yes. for them that will yes. never age. It will never yes. be tempted. It will never go through all the junk that we have to go through. Yes. It, will, it will create this oneness with the Spirit. Yes. Yes. Praise the Lord. So that's, I mean, he's trying to get us to understand there is nothing to fear yes. in any of this. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Look at, I'm going to just show you for some examples here. The old Jewish weddings consisted of several phases. Remember Jesus came and they ran out of wine. It was like seven days. Yeah. They've been partying for yeah. seven days, drinking, you know, and having a good time celebrating the wedding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they run out of wine. And so what does Jesus do? Condemn all of them for drinking? No. No, he turns water into wine. Amen. Yes. 
better way. Now, I've, I've done some weddings. I'm not saying that everybody should do it this way, but I'm saying it doesn't bother me any. Uh, my cousin, in fact, I, I did her wed wedding here a few years back, and I mean, everybody was drinking. They had lawn chairs set up out in the yard, and they all got a beer can, and, and oh, I'm starting the wedding service, and I said, you know, this reminds me, and I've said it other times as well, but I said, it reminds me of Jesus at that wedding. And I said, but today he'd be turning water into beer. You know, <laughs> into Coors Light or something. But I mean, that's the way uh, Jewish weddings consisted of several phases. And they seem to be the pattern or the prophetic word for what Jesus is going to do in our lives. Yes. It starts with a betrothal, a covenant, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. and, it, and it also includes the payment of the purchase price because the guy who is going to marry this girl has to pay a certain amount and the girl has to pay a dowry or whatever it might be. But there's a payment to be made in order for this wedding to take place. And the bride at that point and from that point on is set apart. Yep. She's the same as being married even though she hasn't had the ceremony yet, right? right? And the bridegroom, that, that means sanctified, mm -hmm. right? So it's, it's like us. The bridegroom then, he goes to his father's house to prepare a room addition for his new bride, for him and his wife. The surprise returned by the bridegroom to gather his bride and then lead them all to the wedding ceremony. They'd have a parade. I mean, they'd all go to the wedding supper of the bride. Amen? Now, there's other, that's just one type, but there's other Old Testament patterns or types that all do the same thing. Enoch, he, was, he walked with God and he was not. Why? He, he was out of here before Noah's flood. God took him so he didn't have to go through the flood. Uh -huh. Isaac's absence after being offered. If you go back and read that story, all of a sudden he disappears. Yeah. Ruth and Boaz. Ruth is at the feet of Boaz during the threshing floor scene. Look, at, I want you to just look at this in Matthew 13. And I'm going to read a lengthy verse here, but it's Matthew 13, 37 through 58. And it will show you the pattern that we're seeing a couple thousand years earlier. This woman who is in the lineage of Jesus becomes his great, 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 great something grandmother, Ruth. And, and, and she's at the feet of the kinsman redeemer, who is Boaz, who's going to purchase all the stuff that she lost. And her, and her mother-in-law and her father-in-law, so on and so forth. So he says here, he answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. Now remember, they're on the threshing floor. She's at his feet, at Boaz's feet, the kinsman redeemer. The son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace. Cast them into, that's okay. cast them into a furnace of fire, there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun, again, back to Genesis and Isaiah, in the kingdom of their father who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hid in a field. The which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy therefore goeth and selleth all that he has, and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had, and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea, gathered of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Jesus saith unto them, Have ye understood all these things? And they say unto him, Yea, Lord. Then said he unto them, Therefore, every scribe which is instructed unto the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is a householder, which bringeth forth out of his treasure things new and old. And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these parables, he departed thence, and when he was coming to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue, insomuch that they were astonished and said, Whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? 
Is not his mother called Mary and his brethren, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas and his sisters? Are they not all with us? Whence then has this man all these things? And they were offended in him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not honored without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. We're living in a time where, uh, well, I mean, even when I was a child, uh, which was a number of years ago, it, it was normal to be thought of as a Christian. It was an average, normal thing. Today you're mocked. Today you're laughed at. Today you're ridiculed as an idiot, a moron, bigot, homophobe, who knows what. Yeah. Anything that turns the attack on you. Jesus said, he did the same thing to me. Yeah. So there has to be faith in order for miracles. There has to be a people who believe in their identity in Christ yes, no. to do this. Yes, if you can just read that, that little 15, 20 scriptures, and you can see how valuable we are to God, how precious we are in his sight. Uh -huh. It's like the bridegroom and how infatuated he is with the bride. Because they haven't been married yet. Just kidding. But you know what I'm saying. They're just, you know, crazy. Yeah. Do anything. I love her. You know, hey, right, come on, let's. And that's God's, that's his, he's trying to use something that we can understand to show us how much value we have to him. Right. How much he loves us. Right. How much he wants to do for us. Amen. Praise the Lord. How about, here's another. Daniel, absent from the fiery furnace. He, we know he didn't, we know he opened the windows and prayed. We know he was thrown in the lion's den. Why wasn't he in the fiery furnace? It's, a, it's just a, a sign. It's just a, a pattern of being delivered. Some are going to die. Some are going to go through the fire, right? In the natural, some will be asleep. Some will go through the fire. But some won't. Some will be delivered. And even those who go through the fire end up coming out a winner. Saved. New creature. Amen? The concept is that of being imminent. Everything he talks about is about being imminent. I-M-M-I-N-E-N-T. Mm -hmm. The expectation of what God's going to do. Yes. That's called faith. That's, yes. that's hope. That's, yes. that's what we have to live by. Yes. And it's not, it, it, it's not to be confused with imminent with an, with an A. The concept that God is not only transcendent or far above, but that he's always with us and actively involved in everything that we do. Amen? Anything he, anything he does, he does it on our behalf. Yes. You know, it's, it's like a parent sometimes. A child wants to go rollerblade, you know, down Euclid. <laughs> right? You say, no, uh, that's not a good idea. <laughs> and the kid's upset. Right? Because I didn't get to go rollerblade down Euclid. Duh! Yeah. We, we met two people on snowmobiles yeah. coming up the middle of the road. Yeah. Highway. Yeah. One of them went down the ditch, and the other one just went like this, like, get over. Yeah. <laughs> You're in my lane, and there's snow and ice everywhere. You've got the snowmobile. i got a pickup. You know? I lost a little of my Jesus back there on that highway. It's coming back to me now, I'm just saying. But that's kind of the attitude, like, come on. Get a clue here, man. And sometimes we have to deal with our children that way. Not because we don't want them to have every good thing that's possible for them. We just don't want them to jeopardize themselves or get hurt or, or do harm to themselves simply out of ignorance. Right. Right. Praise the Lord. So we're living in a time that the Bible says more about than any other previous period in history. True. The Bible is talking about these last days from Genesis 1. Yes. Yes. Praise the Lord. Including when Jesus was here in the flesh. There, there's more going on now. Then even when Jesus was here living in Galilee and Judea, the ultimate issue for every human being is the identity of Jesus Christ. Yes. Is he or is he not God in the flesh? Yes. Praise the Lord. Is Jesus who he said he is? Yes. That's the question that's being asked yes. everywhere. Yes. Amen. His crucifixion was not a tragedy, folks. No. 
It was an achievement established before the foundation of the world. God did it. He did it to himself before the world even was created. So another revealing discovery is that he was also the most anti-religious person who ever walked on the face of this earth. Amen. Believe me, God is not religious. No. He's holy. He's spiritual. He's love. Religion is man's attempt to reconcile himself to God. And God said it can't be done. There's as much confusion on this subject in the church as there is outside of the church. Can I talk to people that are believers, that are Christians, and they'll argue about it too. The issue is relationship, not rituals. It's not what you know. Tim said it this morning. It's who you know. Yes. It's not how much you can quote. It's not how much you can point your finger at somebody else. It's how much do you know the Lord? How yes. comfortable are you in the presence of God? Amen. Matthew 7, 21 through 23. We know most of us that went through the religious parts of our life. We've spent as much or more time trying to unload a lot of that baggage yeah. in order to understand what God's yeah. really trying to tell us, you know? Right. So, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. What's the will of the Father? Believe on him who I have sent. Yes. And yes. me that sent us. Right? Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So I'm, again, I'm, this is not my job to judge who that is or who that isn't. All I know is that if you are believing in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're on the right side. You're, you're in a good place. Amen. But if you're just a religious promoter, amen, a Barnum and Bailey kind of thing, that doesn't identify you with God. No. You, you know, we've all seen the services where people are, you know, getting laid out all over the place and, you know, all kinds of stuff is happening. Look, they're saying, I did, did you see what I did? And now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start a big church in, somewhere, you know, because I got my name out there and everybody's seen me and they saw the miracle. That's not God. No. <laughs> it's not God. That's man wanting the glory. That's man saying, look what I did. Yes. Yes. And, and Jesus even said in another place, he said, if, if, the, if the praise of man is what you're looking for, yeah. that's all you're going to get. Because yes, right. this isn't about what we can do. No. It's about what God will do yes. to a believer who trusts yes. in him yes. and his truth and his reality. Lord. Amen. Yes. He says, in, in, look at uh, John 5, 39. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. This, all of this is about is bringing us to Jesus. Yes. It's not about the rules and the regulations. It's about getting people to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Right. Believe that God raised him from the dead yes. and confess him as your Lord and Savior yes. with your mouth. Yes. Believe in your heart, right, in your spirit. He says it in Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man, let's think about that, anybody, I don't care who, I don't care your past, I don't care what you've been, I don't care what you are, I don't care any of that stuff. If anybody will hear my voice or, and open the door, if you believe that God's there, that he's here, and you cry out to him, he will come in to you. He will come in. He said, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he yes. with me. Now that is a commitment, church. Yes. And that's a commitment by God Almighty, not Nathan, not any of us, not some religious leader. That's what God has said. Yes. So whoever's listening to this message, wherever you are, if you believe that God is real, 
open the door. I mean, just say yes, Lord. Just say yes. Well, I don't understand it all. I don't know how to figure it all out. I don't have the theology. I just believe that you are and that you came to save me. And if you'll do that, he will open the door and come in and suck with you. He will eat with you. He will be family with you. Praise the Lord. It's that simple. It's not complicated. 1 Corinthians 1, 18. And I'm going to close with this. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Oh, don't we know some of them? Yeah. A lot of them in Washington, D.C. Yeah, yeah. they are. But a lot of them right here in our own community as well. Yeah. But for the preaching of the cross to them is foolishness. Yeah. Them that perish. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yes. So there's only two categories, folks. Those that perish and those that are saved. Yes. And the only difference is we have believed yes. in the one who came to save us. Yes. We believe the word of Almighty God yes. that came in flesh yes. and delivered us yes. from the devil yes. and from ourselves. Yes. It's not complicated. Only believe his yes. grace is sufficient. Amen. It is. And you will be saved. Yes. Give the Lord a hand. Yes. Amen. Amen. So the next prophet that comes along, and, and look, hey, I listen to him too. I'm just saying, if it doesn't line up with this, I'm not interested. I've heard from the prophet of prophets. Amen. Amen. And his word is right here. It's that close to all of us. We can escape the enemy and the ravages of hell yes. and have a perfect paradise yes. for eternity. I don't know how it all works out. I just know the metaphors of the streets of gold and all that, they sound pretty good to me. Yeah. I'll take how, however yeah. he wants to serve it up, I'll be happy to receive it. Yeah. Praise the Lord. In the meantime, we need to be bold. Yeah. We need to be strong. We need yeah. to be confident in our God. Yes. That's what's going to change people's minds. That's what's going to cause people to think, what did they have yes. that they're not freaking out when everybody else is freaking out? Yes. Well, we have Jesus, yes. and that's the difference for that everybody, is. and they need to know it as much as we did. Yeah. Give him one more hand. Yes. Praise God. <laughs> Amen. Amen. God bless all of you. Appreciate you being here this morning. See you next week. Have a great week in Jesus. Yes.